looking for, which is a discussion of our very own Laura Gomez's exciting new book, Inventing Latinos. And I want to take a moment to both introduce uh, Laura, but before I do that, I want to thank everyone for who made the event possible, all of the staff and others, Jasmine Coley, our director of the Critical Race Studies our, our, um, uh, Program Director of the Critical Race Studies Program and to all of the staff that has helped make this possible. I know we have a lot to talk about, uh, but I do want to start by way of introducing my longtime friend and colleague, Laura Gomez. Uh, many, Laura is known, known to many of you, but for those who are not familiar, Laura is a co-founder of the Critical Race Studies Program and is currently the faculty director. She has been the author of groundbreaking work uh, in the field and starting with her first book, Misconceiving Mothers, which uh, took a look at the construction of the crack baby academic, uh, epidemic through the lens of uh, kind of a historic, a sociological, I should say, legal historical sociological investigation of how this ec epidemic was structured through racial and gender lens. Um, she followed that with another major book, uh, Manifest Destinies, which is now in its second edition. Uh, it's a book which links the history of the West to um, the history of slavery and the Civil War, something that I think we often don't think about, but Laura's uh, attention to the question of how race functioned in New Mexico, both brought to light the connections between those histories and the important point regarding the fact that we often think about the history of the West uh, as one of uh, expansion and immigration, when in fact we really need to think about it through the lens of colonialism. Um, this book has actually become widely taught outside of law and it has, in fact, I think, Laura, uh, correct me if I'm mistaken, was adopted by the state of New Mexico uh, as part of its curriculum at some point. Is that, did I get that wrong? Um, it was Albuquerque Ethnic Studies, Al Albuquerque okay. Public Schools Ethnic Studies. All right, studies. yes. And um, is an indication, I think, of the power of the insight and the way in which it connects to uh, people in many, many different fields. Um, she also uh, was, in fact, um, she left, a, she began her teaching career here at UCLA, but she left us for a time period and actually served uh, as faculty and for a time associate dean of the law school at the University of New Mexico. But we are very happy that she returned to us in 2011 and has been uh, with us ever since. She also uh, has been a leader in the field in terms of looking at the intersections between law and sociology, and in fact was head of president of the Law and Society um, Association for uh, several years. But um, we could go on with her resume, but I think we're really here today to talk about this very exciting new book, Inventing Latinos, and Laura, uh, I wanna thank you for this book uh, as I shared with her um, privately the other day, one of the things that I really found powerful about the book is that it speaks across uh, audiences. That is to say, it is not written entirely for academics. It is written for people who are just interested in the field and finding a way to both provide something that is intellectually rich and deep as well as accessible is no easy task. Um, and so I wanna congratulate you for really writing a book that's eminently readable understandable and deep all at the same time. Um, so let's start by way of the beginning, maybe talking about the title. So the title begins with invention, which uh, you know implicates that there's something being created that didn't exist before, or maybe it's something made up. Uh, and I just wanna ask you, what did you mean by putting invention into the title and how does that relate to what you see as the central project of the book? Thank you so much, Cheryl. That and and thank you for that really generous introduction. And and uh, I want to thank thank you especially and um, Jasmine Coley and um, the tech staff here at the law school for making this possible, and everybody in the audience for being here. You know, we're in such such strange times right now, and everybody's um, not only socially but also I think personally, everybody's lives are 
are just challenging. And so I appreciate uh, you being here, especially Cheryl and, and, and everybody in the audience joining us. But yeah, so um, I'm really glad that you asked about the title because um, I, I've been doing some radio interviews and I get, get questions about that because people think inventing, what, is, what does that mean? Because normally we think, okay, you invent a product, right? Um, but in this case, I'm, I'm using it in uh, the, the sense of, first, that, that this notion that uh, prior to thinking in terms of uh, the 1980 census, when we started counting Latinos as a national population, we didn't really think about Hispanics or Latinos in a national sense um and 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 now that's become ubiquitous right that we we think that way and so the book you know and i'm sure in our in our questions we'll get into some more of that but there's a second way in which i'm using inventing one which is very um central to the critical race theory project and that is um i want to invoke this notion of the social construction of race and um, by that, I mean to say that race is historically contingent. Um, it, it, the, the racial categories that we have, they reflect a particular time period and a particular uh, political uh, terrain and, uh, and a cultural terrain and so forth. And um, so, we must understand Latinos and Latinidad, Latino identity today happening at a particular context of the United States um, project and the United States racial state, right? So, so um, and, and, you know, it's this, the social construction of race, and many of you will be familiar with that idea, but I think for a lay audience, it is, is not as commonly understood. And one of the essential features um, that we must recognize with it is, is to say that race is socially constructed is not to say that it doesn't have real effects, right? So um, I say racism isn't real, I mean, race isn't real, but racism is, right? So, um, and in fact, everything in our social world, we we give it meaning because it because it it um, it takes meaning in our in our in our lives, and it over time, it becomes um, it becomes real. So that that's really the sense in which I'm invoking uh, the word uh, inventing. Uh, the, the phrase inventing Latinos. Thank you. Um, let me follow up on that. And um, because one of the things that came across as I particularly read the introduction and you posit or kind of a, um, look at a different period in time, say 30 or 40 years ago, when um, Latino identity, I think as you suggest, was not as salient or not, or, or operated entirely within a kind of um, framework in which one was either black or white. Um, and you give examples of how there were political figures who had Latinx um, heritage, but did not necessarily publicly project themselves as such. And you contrast that with the current moment. Um, and I, I, it struck me that one of the things that, that the story that you were telling is that um, I guess twofold. One is the the way in which racial identity can shift uh, in terms of its visibility or salience over time, uh, and the second, uh, which maybe I, I probably shouldn't do this. I'm giving you two questions at once. <laughs> but um, the second Fine. is um, you say that there are multiple racisms, uh, or um, that there. Uh, Put another way, I think at one point you say there are different racisms that operate differently, but that they are still operating within the framework of white supremacy. Um, and so I wanted to ask, what is it that you see about this moment, perhaps, that has made Latin, Latinx identity more salient than, say, at particular other times? And what does that tell us about the durability 
of white supremacy if in fact um, the different racisms operate differently, that race can become more or less salient at particular times. Um, and how does, how does that sort of buttress or intersect with anti-Black racism? Mm. Thank you. I think you actually squeezed in four or five questions there, Cheryl. <laughs> but um, but they're all great questions. So I'm gonna uh, do my best to uh, to mm -hmm. to get to them. Um, um, so yeah, I, I start out in the book by um, talking about uh, a set of four uh, uh, Latino politicians, um, two from. New Mexico and two from New York and kind of suggesting that the the senior um, two um, had fewer options in terms of identifying racially in a way that was cognizable on the national scene, right? So um, uh, uh, Manuel Lujan in New Mexico who served in Congress for 30 some years, um, he identified as white, even though he was brown skinned and had an accent and was born, you know, um, I think on one of, now that I, uh, one of the Indian Pueblos, San Ildefonso, I think, near Santa Fe, um, and um, uh, Rangel, um, Congressman Rangel, um, Rangel, he, his father was Puerto Rican, but he went by Wrangell, and he, but he was one of the founders of the um, Congressional Black Caucus, right? And so, you know, they didn't have the same sort of degree of freedom, right? That's their their modern counterparts, um, AOC in the Bronx and Ben Ray Lujan in New Mexico, who's uh, likely going to be the uh, next senator from from New Mexico. The the way that they had that kind of um, ability. And again, I'm talking nationally because one of the dynamics that's important, I think, to point out is it wasn't that there weren't the groups that make up Latinos today in the United States before the census counted us in 1980, right? So it's just that we thought of them as as regional groups rather than as national groups, right? So we thought about Mexican Americans in the Southwest and we thought about Puerto Ricans in the Northeast, and we thought about Cuban Americans after 1959 in Florida, right? And and we didn't really think about those how how what they might have had in common, or and they weren't really necessarily perceived by others as having things in common because people in one place didn't necessarily know very much about the other groups, and they didn't think of themselves as as one group, right? Um, now that is not to say that there wasn't, and I, I trace some of this history, that there wasn't extensive racism against Mexican Americans in the Southwest and against those other groups, and and you know especially for Mexican American and Puerto Ricans who are are the two longest um, present uh, uh, in in the United States. Um, so I think that I think that um, this. What happens is that, you know, when, when, when you start to think about what happened that, that led to sort of this transformation in the late 20th century and the early 21st century, um, it certainly has something to do with demographic changes, right? And that in turn has to do um, with a lot of dynamics, uh, some of which maybe we'll go into in, in later questions, but one that I wanted to mention, which is the changes in the 1965 immigration law that um, allowed um, uh, family-based migration, um, and that especially uh, was utilized by Mexican immigrants um, to come to the United States to join their Mexican American families, and of course, at the same time, we see it it used in in uh, terms of Asian immigrants um, who had been blocked from coming to the United States from so long. Um, so, so now let me transition to another part of your question, um, which is 
and it's related, of course, um, which is this notion that I put forward, which is instead of thinking only about racism singular, let's talk about racism's plural. And let's both be um, specific about anti-Latino racism and what that looks like and about anti-African-American racism and what that looks like um, and so forth. But then let's also talk about those, those intersections, where they intersect. And it's often, I think, in the places where they intersect um, that we see the ability of white supremacy to maintain itself, um, the durability, as you put it, of white supremacy, the, the, um, the flexibility of white supremacy, right? Even to the point of, well, which groups are going to be considered white? Which groups are not white? How is that gonna vary over time? And so forth. And so, um, you know, when we think about the demographics right now, um, there are 60 million Latinos in the United States. We're 20% of the US population. Uh, we will be a third of the US population within a few decades. Um, and when, so, so, as I even say those words, right, we have this kind of notion of, oh, there is a Latino group and this is who they are. This, these are their numbers and we can talk about them. And we didn't have that, we didn't have that idea, um, you know, in 1970, say, right? So, so that, those are, so I think, I think I, I maybe hit on a couple of your questions, probably not all of them, but at least enough to, to get people's appetites whetted, I hope. I'm sure, and apologies for piling on, but I think it, it, it reflects the fact that there's a lot of rich material here. So let me dig in a little bit more, which is to say, um, talking about the intersection or, or the way in which uh, anti-Black racism and anti-Latino racism are, operate, um, I think it's a really important moment because we are now in a moment where ostensibly um, there's been a lot of focus on anti-Black racism. This is against the backdrop, of course, though, of a national narrative about colorblindness in which race wasn't to be discussed at all. Um, and the incredibly contradictory uh, moment we find ourselves where colorblindness is still official policy, but we have a white supremacist administration. So one of the questions uh, that I, I, I was trying to tease out here is, how do you see anti-Latino racism operating either in conjunction with or against or in relation to or buttressing mm -hmm. anti-Black racism? And uh, if you can, give us an example or two mm -hmm. of how you see those working. Yes, yes. No, that's that's a great question, and and so I'm glad that we can we can um, talk more about it. I I want to just start with one um, important uh, fact, which is that, um, and and you know I know that you're you're on the same um, wavelength as me about this, Cheryl. But we need to say it out loud, which is is even though in in this conversation I will talk in the same way that you did about anti-Black and anti-Latino racism, we know that there are Black Latinos and there are Latinos, Afro-Latinos, right? And so let's just kind of put, a, put a, a, a pin in that because that's an important part of this book too. But um, we have to acknowledge that Latinos have these um, three, um, racial um, ancestries, right? The, the European um, uh, in terms of the Spanish colonizers to the Americas, um, the um, indigenous population, which um, was decimated with Spanish contact, um, both in terms of actual um, deaths uh, 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 in, in violent uh, conflict with the Spanish, but more in terms of disease, and then later in terms of um, uh, hard labor. Um, and then 
not very long after the Spanish got to the Americas, they began um, uh, uh, forcing, forcibly bringing um, African slaves to the Americas. And, um, and that was millions, millions of people. So from what we know, um, there were actually, um, for example, if you take um, New Spain, which is Mexico, including um, the part of Mexico um, in the southwestern United States today, there were there were as many African slaves there um, at one point as Spaniards, right? Now there were and there were ten times as many indigenous people as those two groups, right? So the mestizaje, the racial mixture that results um, from that, um, has been both about erasure of Afro-Mexicans and Afro-Latinos and erasure of Afro, of, of Indo-Latinos as well, Indo-Mexicanos, but, but, you know, with also with this kind of um, idealized notion of mestizaje, right? So, so that was a, that was a lot, but I just wanted to say that to, to make clear that, you know, even though we we will will talk about identity in the form of um, black identity and Latino identity and, and anti black racism and anti Latino racism that there is a there is a nexus there. Um, so so a couple of examples in that I want to give you um, to thinking about how um, how um, anti-Black racism intersected with anti-Latino racism. And I'll, I'll give an example from Chicago, um, your hometown. And uh, so you can, you can correct me if, I'm, if I'm, I'm getting any of this wrong. But um, so if you think about Chicago, um, between 1960 and 1980, there is a uh, replacement that goes on in the city and it's a uh, it's white flight because of desegregation out of the city and into those neighborhoods that whites are fleeing. It's an an uh, influx of Mexican Americans and Puerto Ricans, and um, that in Chicago there is a sense in which then. Latinos come to play this role as a buffer group. And in some neighborhoods, it was kind of a literal buffer. There was a black neighborhood where whites had left, there were Latinos, and then, you know, or maybe other whites had left and those whites had moved to those white neighborhoods. And then there was a Latino neighborhood, literally as a buffer between a white neighborhood and a black neighborhood. And, you, you know, I don't have to tell you how segregated a city Chicago uh, was and is. Um, so they, in that in that kind of um, framework, Latinos play a role of of policing that white black boundary um, as that buffer group, right? So it's kind of like they have a lot invested in sort of saying they're not black, um, and and that that line is firm, right? So that's that's. That's one example. Um, another example would be um, uh, <laughs> there are lots of them, but I'm trying to think about one that would be fairly uh, fairly succinct here. Um, you know, I think I think what I would say is that um, we're it's important to think about um, maybe thinking about Texas as a good example, thinking about Texas in, in kind of um, mid 20th century. Yeah, here's, here's a good example. So, so as we start to see Brown versus Board of Education and a movement toward um, integration and toward an end to um, de jure segregation in, in all aspects of, of social life, um, Mexican Americans in Texas are facing the question of, well, are we gonna be considered, are we, are we a white group, you know, and, 
you know, are we going to be kind of displaced from that kind of tenuous hold on whiteness that we have because blacks are going to be getting more rights? And I talk about some very, um, very painful in some ways uh, to me examples where Mexican American civil rights leaders basically say, oh, we're not going to, we're not going to become allies with the, the Blacks right now in their fight for civil rights because it's too dangerous for us, right? And again, I think in that respect, they are helping to uphold white supremacy in that, in that time. But not, not to say, and I'll end on a kind of more optimistic um, note, which is not to say that there was unity in that, right? And I remember this, this this one example that I that I mentioned in the book of, of Henry B. Gonzalez, who um, is a was a longtime Mexican American congressman from the San Antonio region, and um, he was uh, at the time in the state Senate, and there was a bill to uh, basically try to roll back Brown versus Board of Education in terms of how it would apply to Texas schools. And this was not affecting Mexican Americans because it was targeting de jure um, segregation, whereas Mexican Americans were subject to de facto or by practice segregation. Um, and Henry B. Gonzalez filibustered for 36 hours to fight and he succeeded in blocking that legislation. So, so you know, there were complex, it, it wasn't always in one direction, but I do absolutely think that some of those actions uh, of uh, Mexican American and even Puerto Rican, we could give some examples there, um, leaders um, and, and civil rights organizations serve to harden white supremacy or to prop it up in a sense in the face of increasing civil rights from, from or increasing progress on the in terms of the, the African-American civil rights movement. Yes, thank you. And I was thinking actually about one of your earlier essays um, that I know was related to your earlier book. And actually I see flavors of it in this one as well, which has to do with the ambivalent situation of Latinos as either an ethnic group uh, or a racial group and how they're being situated as an ethnic group actually ends up functioning to buttress the system of white supremacy. And I think in your book, you actually say um, that if by positioning Latinos as ethnics, mm -hmm. you both erase the, the history of colonization, but you also uh, position them as sort of virtuous immigrants against the backdrop of, of sort of um, perpetually degraded uh, Black identity. And I particularly think about this, uh, the irony of this in the context of the current moment, mm -hmm. where we have a kind of demonization of the immigrant. Um, but yet, and still, uh, I think making your point about the shape-shifting nature of white supremacy, so that the immigrant can be both a virtuous mm -hmm. figure that is used to discipline what is seen as a domestic yeah. racial group, and of course, I'm really glad you said the thing about Afro-Latinos because we could also talk about the positioning of Blacks as a domestic group mm -hmm. when in fact, obviously, Blackness encompasses the diaspora. We could start with Barack um, and work our way out um, or even Kamala uh, at this mm -hmm. point, and thinking about the, the, the diasporic nature of Black identity, which is often uh, suppressed or kind of overlooked. But um, I wanted to actually pick up uh, on this other point that I think is important that you make, um, actually relevant to what you were um, just saying, which is um, how do you see um, this pattern that you're talking about, um, that you're trying to refocus our attention on the relationship between immigration and colonialism? And I see this also as being connected to your earlier book, but uh, very explicit and kind of bringing it forward from a historical point to the, to the current moment. Um, this connection between colonialism and immigration, and you use the epigraph, I think, in the book, we are here because you are there. Um, how 
do you see this in the current moment as leading to what you argue for in the book, uh, that due to imperialism, uh, Latinx people should be treated, you say, as involuntarily present. Um, could you say some more about that and tell us what you think that analytical shift in perspective might do? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for, for that and for, you know, framing that so eloquently. So, so yeah, the, the first chapter is entitled, you know, We Are Here Because You Were There. Um, and it's a quote from a um, South Asian uh, uh, Britain active in civil rights whose name is very long, and I'm afraid that I'm not going to. <laughs> you, you noticed I didn't try. I you know, know I know, and I feel a little guilty not giving him credit because it's a great quote, although mm -hmm. he's passed. He's passed on fairly recently, actually, in the last couple of years, a, a great uh, civil rights leader. But um, it's a great quote because and he talks about, you know, needing to put colonialism and immigration on the same continuum, right? And um, I, 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 it's so... I mean, and and like you said, this is uh, this is partly what Manifest Destinies is about too, right? Uh, in in a lot of ways, um, you know. Sometimes, and I don't know, Cheryl, if you can identify with this, but sometimes I feel like I've been trying to write the same book over and over again just to tr finally make myself understood, or you know, try to to. I totally get it, and one of the things <laughs> I guess I would say is when you're making a big push against a kind of received wisdom, yeah, uh, and and you're making it over time. Yeah, it takes many change. books. <laughs> you know, you, you, you kind of got to make the point again. Yeah. Because it, 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 it's, it's hard to see. Yeah. No, yeah. thank you for that. That's a great, you know, it is, it is really, I am pushing back on some things that are, mm -hmm. you know, considered settled. And so I feel like I'm not heard yet. So I'm still kind of <laughs> still harping on these things. But, but the, the centrality of colonialism and then immigration in the Latino experience um, is part of the racialization, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, I think that that's the, and, and that's actually something that I think I was not as attentive. I was very, in, in Manifest Destiny, I was very kind of um, adamant about, okay, this is not ethnicity, this is race. And now I think I have a slightly, slightly different nuanced uh, take on that, which is, in fact, the tendency to see Latinos in ethnic terms or as immigrants is part of the dynamic of racialization. Mm -hmm. And we need to flip that and put the attention back on colonialism and imperialism, mm -hmm. right? And if we, and I go through this very detailed um, description of U.S. imperialism in Central America, in Mexico, and in the Spanish Caribbean, in the Dominican Republic, um, Puerto Rico, and It's Cuba. one of my favorite parts of the book, oh, by you. the way, and it's not thank because you. I wasn't familiar with the histories, but I think yeah. laying them out like that and seeing the tapestry and the sort of interplay, uh, seeing how these characters and I guess I would say arguments keep popping up and yeah. connecting from these multiple locations. I, I, it's like I say, it's not that I hadn't read any of this history yeah. before, but seeing them together like that is quite powerful. Yeah, I mm -hmm. I, I really appreciate that you that you 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 got that. You know, mm -hmm. um, I you know one of the things that I think is. Um, you know, you could ask, well, why did I choose those places, right? Because I mm -hmm. could talk about all of Latin America, but I, I talk about Mexico um, and Mexican origin Latinos are 70% of all Latinos in the United States. Um, only 20% of them are immigrants of the Mexican origin of us, I guess, mm -hmm. are, are, are immigrants, right? But we still have Mexican origin. And Central Americans combined are about 10%. Puerto Ricans are about 10%, Cubans and Dominicans are between three and 4% each. So when you add all of that up um, together, um, those regions are about 96% uh, of all Latinos, right? So 
I'm covering most of the um, most of the ancestral uh, lands uh, of of folks with that, and so so you know it, it 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 is striking, I think, to just see the relentlessness of the U.S. imperialism, and it's it's imperialism in terms of military. Imper you know, gunboat diplomacy was kind of the polite way of putting it, but. But you know, these are countries where where the Marines occupied some of them for 20 years. You know, this isn't something in passing. It's also um, economic imperialism. I talk about the United Fruit Company and its legacy. You know, the building of the Panama Canal and the the centrality of that was that was a military. Um, certainly, it was a, a military. Um, you know, we, we got the canal and we had the canal zone for, for all those years and, and ran it as a military base with all that that entailed, uh, a military complex. Uh, but it was also an economic uh, objective, right? To, to connect the Pacific and the Atlantic. Um, but in other places, it was white settler colonialism as in the Southwest, right? Um, in, in, uh, it wasn't, it was, you know, look at Puerto Rico, right? Puerto Rico is still in a colonial status, right? Mm -hmm. 122 years later. Um, and so one of the reparations that I call for is Puerto Rican statehood, which I think has become, you know, less controversial, both from the mainland side and the Puerto Rico side, because you and I both have known, you know, there was a very, a very significant independence movement for, for Puerto Rico for, for a long time. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, with the crises of the Hurricane uh, Maria and the, the, the financial crises, um, that that movement has really waned. And I think now there is consensus um, on the island, and we need to we need to do that here so that Puerto Ricans will have full citizenship, including representation in Congress and the the right um, to vote for for president. Now, interestingly, because they are in this colonial status, Puerto Ricans can actually migrate free, uh, freely between the island and the mainland, unlike the other groups, right? So in terms of Central Americans in particular, what I'm arguing for in this book is that um, if you, if, you know, you look at that history that I trace out, and it's, it's not ancient history, although it starts um, in the 19th century, it comes up to very recently, including uh, the Reagan administration's support for the Contras and the, the 30,000 some uh, mostly indigenous Salvadorans that they killed um, in the 80s. And, you know, that created the dynamics of displacement um, in El Salvador and other Central American countries. And that's created also the violence, the state-sponsored violence, trained military personnel and death squads trained by American military and given funds to buy American uh, armed arms, um, that to me, now those folks coming here who've, who've come here already, but who are trying to come now, they're not coming voluntarily and we are complicit in that, right? Um, and therefore, um, there's no reason that we shouldn't be um, granting them country-based asylum, right? Not individual-based asylum. We did that for the Soviet Union. We did it for Vietnam and Cambodia. We did it for Cuba. We did it for Nicaragua when the Sandinistas took power. So we can do that. We have done that. And, um, you know, there was a ruling yesterday on uh, TPS, Temporary Protective Status, um, you know, uh, that sided with the administration. And, you know, one of the arguments was, well, this was designed to be temporary. Well, it was designed to be temporary. It was by design that it was not addressing the systemic uh, problems that produce poverty and violence in Central America and that are pushing people here. Um, so, um, you know, that's that's one of the uh, forms of of reparations. I call it reparations because you know reparations can mean a lot of different things. It, the root word is repair. Right, and so I think that that would be an important and, and big step 
Well, thank you. I, I, I probably, you know, with, there's so many things to discuss here. It'd be really interesting to, to think more about Puerto Rico and its uh, sort of uh, euphemistically described uh, territorial status and why the United States refuses to recognize it as its colony uh, and the repair for that as statehood. I, it's a really interesting uh, debate and I, I but I want to actually turn to something that I probably should have posed to you in the beginning, uh, which has to do with your definition of the group that you're looking at, uh, which is you define uh, Latinos, the object of, of, of this work, as descendants of migrants or migrants from Latin America and the former colonies of Spain. Um, you specifically uh, explain this as excluding Spanish immigrants to the United States from Europe. Um, you're more so interested in the descendants of those that were formerly colonized. Mm. And you make an argument that Latinos is a specific U.S. Uh, racial category legible in the context of the United States. Um, and I had a, sort of a, I wanted you to say a little bit more about that. And I wondered, although obviously they're not a significant uh, percentage of the population, how do you situate descendants of uh, the Portuguese colonies that enter the yeah. United States. So we're talking about Brazilians and maybe a couple of the other uh, formerly Portu Portu um, control territories controlled by the Portuguese. Yeah. No, mm -hmm. that's, sorry. No, that's it. No, it's a, a, no that's, that's an important question. So, so, um, and, and so, so you, I think you've, you very accurately characterize, you know, who who I'm talking about. I'm really interested in the sort of the the people created via double colonization, mm -hmm. uh, the Spanish, and then on top of that, the U.S. imperialism, and 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 that is that is you know again I'm taking out it, it's a small percentage the number of of people who say in the sense of that they're Hispanic Latino, but who are descendants of Spain uh, directly um, is as opposed to the people in New Mexico, some of, uh, some of my people who will, will say sort of figuratively loosely that they are Spanish. I'm talking about the real Spaniards, taking them out because treating them as, as uh, white Europeans. Um, and I made a decision to exclude the the others. And you could also inquire about, you know, why don't I include Haiti, right? Which shares an island with the Dominican Republic. Uh, why don't I include some of the English speaking Caribbean? Uh, why don't I include the, the former colonies of Portuguese, most namely Brazil, right? And it was really, it, it really wasn't a, um, it was more about managing what I thought I could manage in a coherent story, right? And thinking about, because for me, so many of the link, so, so it's not about, I guess, let me say this and then I'll explain why I, why, what I think it means is I don't, I'm very, open to anyone who wants to call themselves Latino to call themselves Latino, right? But, you know, in, including Brazilians, and I welcome that, right? And, but I am looking at sort of the aggregate sort of social construction of this group. And in that story, it was very, um, what happened under Spanish colonialism and the character of white supremacy under white um, under spanish colonialism is very integral to this story right and so that's 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 where we really get into that mestizaje and and it's carried over after the uh america's um countries become independent from spain um this notion to kind of whiten their countries and even in many cases offer you know, in the cases of Argentina, Cuba, uh, Colombia, probably some others I'm forgetting, offer uh, large homesteads to Spaniards and other European immigrants to come and whiten their, their countries, right? Um, but 
so I really wanted to talk about the these layers of mestizaje and how that impacts what's going on um, in the United States today. And I wasn't sure, I didn't know enough. I don't think I know enough about the former Portuguese colonies to be able to kind of, you know, make the same analytical claims. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, I just felt like it was a, a bit of a different project, but I have mixed feelings about it, as you can probably sense some of my ambivalence. Well, I can understand, um, you know, we might talk about how conceptually there are um, obvious connections, but to your earlier point about different racisms and multiple racisms, um, I think we can say that about colonialisms as well, right, which is that you know, there's the British form of colonialism, there's French, there's Spanish, and while they're certainly interconnected, their histories are somewhat distinct. And so, uh, you know, on the one hand, while um, there may not be much of a distinction between the groups uh, um, in terms of their countries, of their origins, of their ancestors, um, their patterns um, are likely to be shaped by those different histories. And uh, in trying to tell a story, one does need to, uh, if you're both trying to be specific and accurate, um, it, it does require thinking about it uh, in, in a particular way. I, I wanted to um, turn, I guess, to the moment that we're in, which is leading up to this very, very consequential election. And there's, um, I think, one, a, a couple of points which relate to um, how Latinos or Latinx people are perceived in, in the context of political discourse. So there's often been a, and, and you really get this now, uh, a sense in which uh, Latinx are the sleeping giant, you know, the people that are, because of the demographic shifts that you've just described, are going to flex their uh, electoral muscle at some point and break into the political uh, system in a way that has yet not, or has not yet happened. Um, and I, I actually saw um, something yesterday or the day before uh, where there was an attempt to assess um, Trump's popularity among Latino voters Mm -hmm. um, and describing to some degree, I think the pundit was sort of describing some degree of surprise that there was that there were Trump supporters among the Latinx vote, given the kind of mm -hmm. uh, racist invective that Trump has really deployed with reference to Latinx uh, immigration in particular. So I just wanted you to mm -hmm. talk about how you see this uh, portrayal of Latinx as a sleeping giant in the context of the current political moment and tell us what you think is going on. Yeah, um, it, um, thank you. That's, that's, a, a, that's a big bundle of things. I wanna, if I can just take one sentence just to go back to our last question, I just wanna make sure that you mentioned this in your question and I meant to just reaffirm it. When I talk about Latinos, when we talk about Latinos, we're talking about a US racial formation, mm -hmm. right? You mm -hmm. said this, and I just want to make sure people get that, that we're not talking, it's, it's, it's irrelevant and ridiculous to talk about Latinos in Mexico mm -hmm. or Latinos in, you know, Guatemala, right? Mm -hmm. That, that it, this is a U.S. racial formation. Okay, so how, so getting to this moment, we're 48 days away from the election wow. today, uh, wow. which is, is kind of scary in some ways. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that um, there is this idea, and it's a fairly, you know, it's a fairly, uh, I think, entrenched one that Latinos punch below their weight, right? That we we are not really, um, you know, if we're twenty percent of the population, but we're we're not electorally um, engaged at that level, and 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 why is that? Well, one reason is actually, and, and I think people forget, they just say, oh, well, they're apathetic or, you know, they're immigrants and they haven't acculturated. But actually, you know, we're, we, we have a third of Latinos are under age 18. So 
they're not eligible. Children aren't eligible to vote, right? And I remember seeing some data. Um, oh gosh, let's see if I can remember it. It was it was looking at the 2016 turnout in was it Florida? I, mean, I forget which state, but and then the 2018 turnout in the midterms. And there were like, maybe it was California data. Maybe it was California data. It was like 4 million people uh, were registered to vote. Latinos were registered to vote just two years later. And the vast majority of that was because they aged into being eligible to vote, not because they were immigrants who became naturalized or, right? So, so you know, that's actually really, I think, uh, an important point to make. And I think that for that reason, you know, the Democrats have to figure this out, right? Because right now I kind of have the sense of, well, what are the, what is the Biden-Harris campaign doing to really energize the Bernie Latinos, right? Mm -hmm. Who were a very significant number in California and in Nevada. Um, and even in other states, Arizona and New Mexico, they were a, a good sized chunk of the Democratic um, turnout. Yeah, support, so, for, support for T.O. Bernie. Right? T.O. Bernie, exactly. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he wasn't always my cup of tea, but, you know, I, I respect very much the he, he was kind of like a he he was kind of like a Tio, you know. Some yeah. people love him, and yeah. sometimes not so much. The intensity of their support, though, right, mm -hmm. for him, and is that going to be, is that going to be, uh, you know, is there going to be something exciting enough? Uh, is 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 defeating Trump, you know, like enough to get them to get them out? I hope it will be. But really, I think the Democrats need to think about the future, the future generations. Now, well, in terms of I, I'm sorry, go ahead. I, no, I just had well, to drop this yeah. on what you were saying. So it seems, I mean, to your point, it seems as though the Democrats are operating under the assumption that Trump's virulent racist attacks on Latinos and immigrants uh, is sufficient to mobilize the Latino vote um, without taking on board the question that there are many issues that are yeah. relevant to Latino people, of course, immigration being quite yeah. high and the racialized nature of immigration obviously being salient to, to, to a lot of people. But there is, it seems as though a huge amount, it's my editorializing, this is a dinner mm -hmm. book, so please let me, let me just say that. Um, there seems to be a great deal of attention being paid within the Democratic Party to going after the gettable Republicans or the disaffected Republicans, but not so much on this question. Um, and it seems as though in part it's because of a kind of uh, maybe bifurcated or bi almost bipolar conception of Latinos as a sleeping giant that is demographically powerful, but then against the backdrop of what you just said, a population that is very young and can't vote, or uh, to some extent uh, can't be relied upon to mm -hmm. vote mm -hmm. uh, without looking at the various ways in which there is voter suppression and how it operates mm -hmm. uh, for Latinos. Um, so I, I just say that as a little editorial mm -hmm. comment yeah. to talk about the current moment as one in which once again, the kind of conception of the group uh, mm -hmm seems to be a little bit uh, amorphous, uh, or I shouldn't say amorphous, but not, not quite clear, and therefore leading to a kind of murky um, strategy, which and means in some, in that, some, it, go ahead, in sorry. In some ways, it's not, it's not unlike the attitude toward sort of the young left African-American voters, right? Yes. Right. It's, it's like, well, we're going to put our money where the Democrats are saying that, that at least the Biden-Harris, we're going to put our money where this sort of very solid, you know, sort of uh, uh, middle-aged, especially women, they're going to come out. We got to make sure that we get them out. But, you know, you're right. Like that, that little bit of, oh, there's maybe some Republicans we can pull over. Mm -hmm. Well, that's as unknown as pulling over youth or, mm -hmm. you know, pulling over the far left, right? Mm -hmm. In 
who, who might, might or might not turn out depending on circumstances that week, right? Especially with everything going on. But, but the Republicans, I think, are, I think the Republicans are, in terms of the Latino vote, the Republicans are, you know, there's always going to be a population of Latinos who are, it may be more anti-Latino than the next guy, right? Hmm. Uh, you know, certainly they're anti-immigrant, right? They're maybe competing more with immigrants than than others, right? And um, and it's also internalized racism, you know, right? Like we we can't discount that either. The the kind of motivation to say, oh, I'm not like them, so I'm going to show you, and I'm going to vote, you know, I'm going to vote with the GOP. Mm-hmm. Um, so there is there is that population, and my question is how big is that population? I was having an interesting conversation with a friend of mine who's, who's uh, more to the middle of the road and maybe a little right of the middle of the road. And he was saying, oh, I think it's gonna be, we actually put a bet on it because he said, I think it's gonna be 32%. And I said, oh no, it's gonna be like 20%, you know, right? And where that, where, where that is, is it's, you know, we're not sure. One of the things that I'll mention to you is Many times, and after the 2018 midterms and after 2016, there was this debate about exit polls, right? And so how many people voted for Trump in 2000, how many Latinos voted for Trump in 2016? And I am of the opinion that that the exit, exit polling strategy is flawed because what they've done, what they usually do is they go to high voter turnout polling places. Well, high voter turnout polling places um, uh, often are affluent white neighborhoods. Now, I think for African Americans, because they've been such a good turnout group, they know where to go for high voting turnout African Americans. And because of, you know, good old segregation that we have, residential segregation, but they will go to these, you know, white neighborhoods and they'll pick up um, Asian Americans and some Latinos there, but the Asian Americans and the Latinos that they pick up are not necessarily representative of the broader group. I would think that that's all gonna be more precarious this year because of COVID, right? So that we have, you know, people are voting now very soon, I think, you know, in early October, gonna be voting early and voting by mail. And so how is exit polling even gonna work? And how are you gonna have any sense that that's gonna be? And we just don't, it kind of goes back to, I think where your, your question started originally, Cheryl, is that we don't, the, we don't have good information necessarily, right? And on sort of Latino voters, we're, it's very primitive in a sense, right? And we certainly have not tapped into the activist, uh, the youth, um, people under 30 who are, incredibly active on the, the DACA front and um, uh, who were people who were in the marches in, in uh, even going back to, um, you know, thinking about people who were energized by Prop 187 in that fight, um, people who were energized by the 2006 marches in that fight, and people who are energized this summer because of the um, protest against uh, uh, the the murder by police of George Floyd and and police violence more generally, right? So so you know the Democrats had better instead of taking people for granted find a way to tap into I think those reservoirs of politically animated and politically engaged, but maybe not so much uh, thinking about it in terms of electoral politics. Not surprisingly, we have a couple of really uh, interesting questions and I want to reserve the remainder of our time to okay. get to them. Um, I'm happy to cue them up if you like, or you can. Um, um, I can, I can, let, let's, let's, since we've been talking about voting, why don't I pick up this one? So okay. there's a question that says, um, qu- and, 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 a uh, question, oh, okay, sorry. Um, the Cubans in Florida have a disproportionately strong voting bloc and they support Trump along with the Venezuelans. It's hard to lump all Latinos in one voting bloc. It seems that Puerto Ricans and Mexicans bend more liberal, although their religion also bends them right. 
we need their vote to get him out of office. What is the message? And, and uh, yeah, you, and you probably, um, you know, probably typed that in before some of our conversation wound down. But I want to talk a little bit about Cuban Americans, right? Because they talk about punching above their weight. They really punch above their weight, right? Mm -hmm. They're, they're 4% of the Latino population. And yet, three out of the four uh, Latinos who are in the U.S. Senate are Cuban Americans. And, uh, you know, the guys that we, we know no longer monolithic. The generation who came after, you know, in the, in, in, they are aging out, have passed already. And their, their children and grandchildren don't all feel the same way. So uh, I think that the first uh, Democratic Cuban in 2018. So just, an, it just that, that is, I think, an important point to make in terms of, um, in terms of dynamics, should not be um, lumping all Latinos together all the time. And I, and I try to be very um, careful in this book about talking about the distinctive differences among Latinos, but at the same time, how increasingly part of the racialization dynamic is that other people see us as the same. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so that, that dynamic is very strong. Okay. So, um, so the other question, yeah. if I may, um, relates to the framework, I think that you use of uh, thinking about reparations for some of the consequences of colonialism and racialization that you map out, um, and think about how, what reparations would mean, say, for example, for groups that were affected by U.S imperial projects and what that might mean in terms of granting them certain kinds of statuses in the United States. But of course, Puerto Rico being in the position of um, the uh, colonial uh, entity that the United States controls. Why, I think the question is, is why mm -hmm. do you argue for statehood as reparations for the colonial project that uh, the United States still implements and imposes on Puerto Rico, and what is the what is your sense of why there is a consensus for U.S. statehood at this point? Yeah, so thank you for that question. I I will go back to how we how we think about reparations. So, and it's it's really wonderful that we're actually at a moment in in the nation where we're talking about reparations to African Americans for slavery, right? And, and there's fairly, uh, fairly serious conversation going on about it. And it's, 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 really, it's really exciting. Now, when you think about reparations in that way, and you think about, okay, we can actually, we can actually determine if you were a descendant of a slave in many cases, and, and therefore we can, we can give you some remedy, um, often in the form of money. But reparations doesn't have to be monetary, right? Again, I go back to that root word, repair, reparations, repair, repairing the relationship. And, and Cheryl, you're right to, to link it back. You know, what I'm linking it back to is imperialism and the damage that the U.S. did in these various places. And in that respect, Puerto Rico has borne the brunt of, of that damage for the longest time, um, including having, you know, something like uh, 100,000 uh, U.S. military um, on bases there and being the, the headquarters for our Southern Command and, uh, you know, being a bombing range uh, for the U.S. military in Vieques. And, uh, and, you know, all of the offshore uh, damage that has been done to marine life there because of the uh, testing of, of military weapons and so forth. Um, so that is, that, that those dynamics would be repaired by, by statehood in that there would be representation. Now, whether or not there's I guess, I guess, you know, we could, we could fruitfully debate whether or not there's consensus, because I don't, I don't, I don't know. I have, I have, you know, I, I, some of what I read suggests that the devastation wrought by the fiscal crisis and the 
federally mandated uh, PROMESA, the, the, the board that is now running, the, you know, controlling government expenditures and, and budgets is appointed by the federal government, right? And, and that as I think, I mean, some would argue that it's part of a colonial apparatus. Exactly, I mean, it absolutely. That instead is. of direct rule, you have this sort of mechanism of indirect rule. It absolutely is, mm -hmm. but not to mention that we still have some covert direct rule, right? right. And then the mm -hmm. military involvement. So there are just all these layers, and so um, I think that there is. Um, I think that there is some momentum for for statehood, and it would, at least, it would create the, um, there would be many avenues, more avenues um, to Puerto Rico as a state and in terms of self-determination um, financially and, and otherwise, and having, of course, congressional mm -hmm. representatives. So. Well, I could be misreading the tenor of the question, but I think if I read it right, it's more about uh, accepting the premise of, of the need for repair I think the question on the table is what is the form of repair? Does incorporation as statehood kind of complete the project of colonialization? We could think about Hawaii, for example, as another example uh, in which and New Mexico. statehood, right, and New Mexico, uh, where statehood is, uh, uh, you know, resisted, but at a certain point imposed uh, as a solution, but itself actually reflects the, maybe one might argue the consolidation of the colonial project through yeah. uh, kind of annexation. And given the really contested nature of um, Puerto Rico's claims for independence, how they've been criminalized over the years, how independistas have been subjected to all kinds of political repression, the question might be, do we even know what a kind of unconstrained sense of the Puerto Rican people is about this issue, given the terrain. But I mean, obviously, that's a that's a subject for its own book. Yeah. Um, and yeah. um, but I, I do think it is an interesting question. What does what does repair look like against the backdrop of the kind of deep colonial project uh, that has existed now for nearly two centuries? Um, wh what does that look like? Um, we've got another question here about um, white nationalism and whether or not you have a comment about how white nationalists have attracted Latinx members through um, the claim of um, uh, Spanish heritage. Um, and I think about this in the context of uh, some work that I've read about the ways in which some of the white national, contemporary white nationalist projects have recruited, in particular, men of color, uh, some Southeastern, uh, South Asian men and others to the project of white nationalism. And, and I don't know whether you have any thoughts on that, but. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's a, um, it's a cousin of the dynamic I was talking about with, you know, sort of these fiercely Republican Latinos who who say you know we have too many Latino immigrants here and um, mm -hmm. you know who are pushing back on that this is just a kind of more virulent kind of brand of it um, I mean you know one of the unfortunate things about the the white nationalist movement is that be, under this administration we don't know as much about it as we should. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and there, so I would like to know more about that. Um, mm -hmm. But, but what the only thing that I've seen on it is basically anecdotal, you know, mm -hmm. there's a profile of one particular person and, you know, or one organization at one moment in time or, or one event. Right. And they'll mention, you know, you'll see a Spanish surname and, and it's, it's, it's not very clear. I, I don't know how, mm -hmm. how widespread that is. Well, I, I can say, like you, I don't have much information, and like you, I totally agree. This is a completely understudied um, kind of set of questions. But I do think that, um, just speaking in terms of thinking about um, how white supremacy can work dependent not only on the phenotype of the um, 
of, of a person, meaning how, how is one recruited to the ideology of white supremacy? That is, it is neither automatically or, or exclusively white in its content or, or white in its manifestations. Um, there's both the problem I think you mentioned of uh, internalized racism, but there's also, I think, a kind of set of uh, incentives that are built around um, patriarchy, uh, which is to say the ways in which mm -hmm. these groups, in fact, uh, and masculinity, and masculinity uh, construct a kind of attractive masculinity that travels along with and reinforces a white supremacist message. Um, and so we have a, a, what seems to be on the surface a kind of contradiction, but one of the ways in is again a kind of notion of uh, you know, restoring patriarchal order. Um, and this is not only you know, demographically, at least in terms of the anecdotal journalistic stuff that I've seen, attractive to older generations, but particularly attractive sometimes to younger uh, men in a certain category who feel very destabilized by um, the very shifting ground upon which gender and gender relations uh, are, are uh, being manifested against a backdrop also of deep material instability. Uh -huh. So uh -huh. it, these things kind of all come together in a um, in a really toxic soup to become yeah. attractive to a number of people. I was listening to a, um, I think it must've been on NPR. They were, there was a segment where they uh, were trying to drill down on black voters and to see what their thinking was about Biden, how enthusiastic they were. And they had a range of uh, participants from uh, middle-aged African-American woman younger African-American woman, and they had an African-American man who I think probably was not senior. I mean, he didn't, he didn't seem to be. Uh, and it was very interesting listening to the differences. None of them were enthusiastic about Biden. And in fact, the middle-aged uh, African-American women, as I recall, said something like, if you ask me on a scale of zero to 10, I'm zero in terms of my enthusiasm, but I am going to vote for him because I see Trump as the present danger, which must be resisted. Um, on the other hand, the African American man was uh, lambasting, I think, with without you know, with some degree of accuracy, the Democratic Party for taking for taking black votes for granted. Um, that he saw Biden and Harris as sort of continuing in that sad tradition, uh, and talking about his lack of enthusiasm. But finally, the African American woman listened long enough and said, "But." but excuse me, but who are you going to vote for? And he hesitated and he said, well, I, let me just say that I'm in prayer about that right now and I'm not really certain. And it struck me that, um, you know, obviously you're reading from, you know, a, a five minute um, sort of uh, segment, but it did seem to me that there was a way in which um, gender was factoring into how um, comfortable or uncomfortable one was with an administration that kind of centered a particular kind of masculinity as its project and uh, the way in which that can even have traction even against a backdrop of a viciously anti or a viciously racist uh, agenda. Right well it, it's it, it's actually one of the the real um strengths of Trump, right? That he taps mm -hmm. into that, a, a particular kind of masculinity. And it's, it, he taps into it for, or he did in 2016 for some women too, right? Mm -hmm. um, those white women um, who were voting for him were, mm -hmm. they also, you know, wanted to kind of, there was this sense of, like you said, the, the ground is shifting too much and we mm -hmm. wanna be able to hold on to something that is recognizable, um, mm. you know, uh, and, and, you know, we don't want to be, you know, sharing bathrooms or whatever sort of nonsense uh, argument you right. Know, uh, right. they were, right. were thinking of. And, and, you know, I think if there's one kind of, you know, one of the takeaways from this, this time with Trump has been that he is, 
you know, that almost everything he does is about impressing other men and a certain kind of, you know, and some women in terms of impressing men, right? Like, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, just listening to some of these tapes that have been released uh, recently from the Woodward interviews, right? And, you know, how he was thinking about Kim Jong-un and, you know, and these, 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 you know, what he, it's just, it's just really something. It's really, really deep. Yeah, yeah it is. Really deep. Um, we had, I, we had another question in the queue and I'm trying to find it now. Um, well, why don't we take, why don't I answer this one that's here about, um, about education, if I, if I can, what about okay. this? Do you see this one? Uh, okay, so I'm going to read the question. Yeah, and you then, go ahead. You go ahead. Yeah, and then you, you can help me interpret it, Cheryl. Okay. We're in a time where decolonizing is being used in common discourse, including around education and pedagogy. Mm -hmm. And I should add at a, both the K through 12 and especially college level. What are your thoughts on the use of the term in this way? as the true practice of decolonization is about indigenization, which is not possible on a small scale. Mm -hmm. Huh. Um, I guess what I would puzzle over is I'm not sure about the indigenization mm -hmm. frame and what that might mean. Mm -hmm. um, to the extent that, you know, maybe what the questioner is invoking here is um, some critique of the post-independence countries of the Americas, right? And, and you know, post-independence from Spain, those countries, the elites of those countries tended to double down on a a kind of assimilationist ideology for mm -hmm. the indigenous populations. Mm -hmm. um, and mestizaje was part of the, the way to do that, right? This notion mm -hmm. that in Mexico and Guatemala and several other countries that to be truly Mexican, you were a mestizo or mestiza and a, a female. And that that was the you know, that was the kind of the epitome. The, the raza cosmica was like, all you just take all these races and you just combine them into one and you have something new. That implies the destruction of the indigenous, right? Mm -hmm. And of the black also, right? So, right. Um, so I think that might be part of what the question is, is getting at. So I think many times when we in the United States use the framework of decolonial or decolonizing, we're using it in a slightly different, maybe a looser way. Uh, you know, for example, right now, there is an ethnic studies bill before um, passed by the California legislature and waiting for a signature from Governor Newsom. So um, hopefully that, that that bill will be passed because I think one of the things that I've, I've really come to see even just in, you know, for a few weeks, the book has only been out for for since August 25th is, is in talking to people and, and talking to um, doing, doing interviews and such is there's such a hunger, uh, I think by, by Latinos of all ages, but I think especially uh, with respect to, to younger Latinos, mm -hmm. um, high school and, and, and college and uh, in their, in their upper twenties too. And, you know, I think that to the extent that we can, start educating those younger generations um, sooner rather than later and and sort of getting them invested in in the academic study of you know of of the country and the state in a way that includes them and their groups i just think we're going to be all the better for that so hopefully mm -hmm. that will be signed and and maybe that's a a useful note on which to uh, to to end here. All right, I really really want to thank you uh, again. I just can't say enough about how much I enjoyed the book um, and how I think it its intervention is really crucial at this particular moment. And um, 
I really want to thank again our audience and the people who have uh, joined us in this conversation and encourage you all to continue to connect with us with at the Critical Race Studies Program. We really are um, basically trying to continue our work under the unusual and oppressive conditions under which we find ourselves, but we, we know that this work uh, will we continue to be necessary and as urgent uh, as much now as, as it's ever been. So um, with that, thank you, Laura. And thank you so much, Cheryl. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye.